I come from a pre-sampler generation. I come from, as a kid, having a tape machine, banging things, taping them, cutting them up, splicing them back together again. And then somewhere in the late 70s, my friend Stephen Payne uh, brought back this thing from Australia called the Fairlight. And, uh, you know, yes, we did all those stupid things. We got my dog to bark and wrote music on that, but, but, but very quickly realized that this was actually um, on the one hand, really interesting, and at the same time, it was actually sort of slightly dull unless you really did something with it, because you know all you were doing is you were taking these still snapshots of a moment in time. Um, but you know, so since the seventies, I've been sampling everything that that makes a noise. And what was the first one? Was it the dog bark? It was probably the dog barking, and then it quickly, you know gravitated towards more sort of interesting things like, ooh, we can do a whole orchestra. Well, we couldn't do a whole orchestra. It's sound because one of the inherent qualities, which I very quickly realized about the Fairlight was, it sounded terrible. Um, and what you put in is not necessarily what you got out. And my flatmate at the time, who was my recording engineer, Steve Rance, um, who was cursed with the gene of truthfulness, said to me, but this thing sounds terrible, you know? And we just spent, I don't know how many tens of thousands of pounds on this thing. And he started taking it apart. And he, you know, to cut a long story short, there were lots of phone calls from my flat to Australia to the Fairlight people and uh, with Steve ending up as being head of software at Fairlight. And my machine constantly being tweaked and updated. But then suddenly all these other samplers started to appear. Like, like I still think the Akai S1000 is one of the greatest samplers. At the end of the day, I don't think the issue really is about the recording medium, but it is about the players and the, and, and the whole team. And I think um, you're not going to get quite the same results by having your mate in the flat next door go and bang on a biscuit tin even though it might be interesting, then if you get some, uh, you know, if you if you get the best players in the world to go and n know where to hit it, you know, what I mean, a drum is sort of this interesting archaic thing, but you know, there are like sweet spots when you hit it just right, and you know, and and, and I mean, these guys have been doing it forever, so so so. It's really about the, the human beings that go and create the sound that ultimately will tell you if it's any good. My sonic world evolves. It keeps evolving. The, orchest the orchestral sounds keep evolving. As, you know, as, as our technology becomes redundant, the funny thing that's never become redundant is are those sounds, are those performances we got from the players. You know, it's the best investment I ever made was to start sampling the orchestra in 1994, it's, it's something I still use on a daily basis because the orchestra is the orchestra. We just keep adding articulations and refinements to it. And the, the same with the percussion. I mean, I could still drag out an old Fairlight and it's still hard to beat the Darbuka samples on that, which were all over Rain Man. And, you know, if I dragged it out now, everybody would be going, wow, this sounds really new. But it's really not new, it's just timeless. Would you say that you have a preference over play versus you know, live music combined with samples? It's not a preference, it's just, it's just that, that's my aesthetic. It, it's very simple. The, the music always sounds best in my head before, you know, as, a, as I invent it, it sounds best in my head. And then from there on, there comes this sort of topsy-turvy slope of sometimes things get better when the real orchestra plays it, sometimes things can't be played. You know, for instance, I mean, if you take percussion, when, when they're all roaring away and they're in the middle of the orchestra, yeah, it sounds fantastic. But the thing you can't do is you can't find the balance between a really, really quiet head and an orchestra playing loud. And when you have a really, really quiet head, it just sort of blooms beautifully in the room. So that's where you have to go and cheat. You have to use technology. You have to, you know, you, it, it's just physically impossible. And one of the things that I love about technology is, is that it forever pushes up against the boundaries of physics. So whatever works, works. And, you know, I, I mean, I remember when, you know, Trevor Horn and I were working together and we started getting people to play to click tracks. And, you know, they just thought that was 
awful and it would take all the humanity out of it as opposed to, you know, the way we thought was that there was a tightness to it. There, so there, there was a, a, there's a commitment to hitting the drum really in time. And it, it took, you know, it took all the musicians a while to get, get round to it, to, to figure out how to groove in this sort of tight way. Um, now everybody does it. Now, Spitfire said that you use more microphones uh, than they do, and that they found it kind of fascinating in the fact that you've got, you can sample and use a sample in the same room, two different sets of samplers, and get completely different sound. Yeah, well, one of the things I'm really interested in is perspective. Um, where in the depth things are happening. You know, I, I try to create these sort of 3D landscapes, basically. And one of the things about that is, is this where you place your microphones, where, what hall you're in. I mean, I think, I think one of the things, one of the reasons I like working with the Spitfire guys, other than that they have a wicked sense of humor, is we seem to sort of agree on the aesthetic that if you put a mus musician into a great acoustic environment, they automatically will get feedback from that environment and play better. You know, so whatever noise they make will be a better noise. I think the things that make up a great sound is a great performance in a great space with a great recording engineer. And each recording engineer has a different style and a different sonic picture in their own head. So for instance, one of the things um, I've been doing on Superman, Batman is, you know, for instance, of using both Alan Myerson and Steve Lipson, you get this sort of, uh, you know, very, very different sonic aesthetics, but they're both really interesting and really uh, valid. And both of these guys have made records or soundtracks or whatever, you know, have made recordings that I love. Um, with Steve, you know, I mean, all the Frankie Goes to Hollywood stuff, the Greystone Slave to the Rhythm. Um, the Annie Lennox re records. I mean, you know, the, the, I, th I think those are sort of milestone recordings. You know, with Alan, obviously, you know, all the stuff that we've done together. I think Alan said, what, 20 years you guys spent together? Um, it, f it feels like 50. Um, <laughs> my, my newest secret weapon as well is, is Tom Holkenberg, uh, Junkie XL, who is a drummer, is huge in the sort of electronic dance music field, is an amazing programmer himself and has, you know, uh, I mean, our aesthetics overlap, but he has different methods of doing it. So I thought, what if we take the same sources and just give it to all these different people and just see what happens? I keep wearing more than one hat. You know, one second I'm the composer, the next second I'm the sound designer. Uh, I can't help myself. I gotta go and sit there and drum tracks come in, etc., and I have to take them apart, and I have to do my own EQ and my own compression, and um, because I hear a sound in my head, and I, and I know how to get there. I mean, you know, I, I suppose, in a funny way, I would have been just as happy being a recording engineer as, as a composer, you know, and sometimes it's actually very difficult to stop me from mangling sounds and engineering or doing doing any of those things and actually getting me to sit down and write the notes. Like a kid in the candy store. Totally, absolutely. Now for this project, I think you're using four engineers, is that right? Uh, who am I using? I got Junkie, I got Steve Lipson, I got Alan Myerson. Who's the fourth one? I am the fourth one. Am I the fourth one? Oh, Jeff Foster. God, yes, I'm, I forgot about Let's start that one again. So much of the stuff originates with Jeff Foster. And, um, you know, Jeff, I think Jeff probably engineered my very first session. It might have been sort of one of his first sessions as well. So we go back, and Jeff knows this whole better, you know, than anybody I, I know. Or he knows how I use that whole. So um, between Jeff and Alan, there is a, you know, there's a sort of a patented Hans Zimmer sound. Um, and then bringing in Steve Lipson and bringing, bringing in Junkie and bringing in myself, you know, there's, there's a way that we can take that raw material. And one of the reasons there's so many microphones is because um, Steve wants a different 
set of microphones than Jeff wants, for instance, and Alan wants a different set of microphones than Steve wants, and they all want them placed in different ways. So um, there's a lot more to be gotten out of it. And it, I'm not even just talking about giving people flexibility. I'm just t talking very much about giving people something that uh, that has a different point of view and is, pro is probably going to have different uses. You know, you're not always going to write the same piece of music, so there has to be a, you, you know, these sounds have to be adaptable. Um, tell me a little bit about working with Jason Bonham. We had the pleasure of being there the day he was recording. And I've just finished this um, movie called Man of Steel and um, at one point, I had this idea of this sort of drum circle, and uh, I invited some of the best drummers in the world into this. I mean, I had Sheila E., I had Pharrell Williams, I had uh, J.R. Robinson, I had Vinnie Cariuta, I had um, Jim Keltner. I mean, okay, so it's, 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 a, it's a fair list, you know? And I'd phoned Jason and said, you know, Jason lives in Miami, and I said, hey, do you want to come in? Just, it's just one day of, you know, fair mayhem. Do, do, do you want to come in? He, he said, yeah, absolutely. And the thing I noticed was that even with all these other drummers around, Jason was just louder. <laughs> um, there, there, there's, a, there's a spirit, you know, there's a, there's a sort of, it's, of course it's in his DNA, you know, and um, I think there's something to be said for that. And it was just a, sort of an absolute delight to have him come in and, because Here's my thing about sampling. The, the, ultimately, there is a performance in every single hit. And, so, and, it, and the personality, it's, it's, music is a sort of a subtle thing. I mean, it's like um, Andy Nelson, the great dubbing engineer, once said to me, you know, how, how come you can recognize an Ennio Morricone track on the first note? You know, because the way his orchestra plays, you know, you, you can recognize the... Um, the character of the players in one note, and this, and so what you try to do is you try to surround yourself with people, you know, this 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 thing, this my little drum circle. This, it wasn't about name recognition. I mean, there is name recognition because these guys are extraordinary, um, because you 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 want to find these players that have a sound of their own, that that where each hit has an identity and a commitment behind it. And, and you hear it, you, you, you feel it, and it, it does something truly extraordinary. It was interesting, Jason said, you know, he doesn't read music, sheet music. Nor do I. He plays from the heart, and perhaps that's something you were looking for. It's, it's always something I'm looking for. I mean, the, 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 the best music really happens once people really know what they're playing and they're not looking at their notes anymore. You know, they have made it their own, you know, and, and I spend a lot of time rehearsing with the orchestras and I found lots of different ways of um, figuring out how to make things so, so it becomes not just, you know, a cold reading for them. You know, I had two weeks of piano lessons, that's my formal education. So I know that that's not the absolute be all and end all of knowing how to make music. Um, Listen, everybody in the world reads, but it doesn't make them into Shakespeare, does it? So the reading part isn't that important. The heart part is important. You know, and, and Jason is all soul and all heart. I mean, he really is. And at the same time, there's a, you know, there's a courage to hit things in a certain way. You know, and there's an imagination that goes on as well, which I really find really great, you know. Plus, the other important thing is he's, he's a good chap to hang around with. You get, get to have a bit of a giggle. Absolutely. Um, now, you did the recording, the percussion recording with Jason on the Newman mm -hmm. stage. Um, tell me a little bit about why Newman versus, say, Air Studios. Completely different acoustic. I mean, Air is a big, um, it's a big hall. It's really a church. So the acoustic is very different, and the Newman stage is a big room, really. Um, plus, it really has a beautiful acoustic. It has a beautiful top end. 